I want to introduce a dear friend to myself and to our community. Pastor Herman Hamilton is a beloved and respected African-American leader. He's the founding and senior pastor of New Beginnings Community Church. And it's important to say that New Beginnings is a multiracial church. And for me, the power of multiracial is paramount in introducing him. Because the statement in founding this church is that we need to bring together people of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different stories, different ages, different generations, and come together as one. And that sense of bringing together is for me a powerful, powerful moment for this moment. We are blessed that they share our building. And I want you to be, to note my language. It's not that they rent our building or that they come and use our building. It's that they share the building. And the reason it's important to say they share the building is that our shared religious vision, the power that comes from letting scripture and faith drives us is magnified when different faiths come together, when different races come together. There is a power that comes from that. We felt it at Beth Jacob after Pittsburgh. Because after Pittsburgh, the members of NBCC came streaming to our services and their presence brought such healing. Pastor Hamilton spoke and his words brought such healing. And it's that coming together and other faiths came and God bless them and I so appreciated it. But being in relationship and knowing Pastor Hamilton and so many of the church being in relationship with us, it was a different level of healing. Pastor Hamilton, you are a healer. You've lifted us up. And since this outbreak, I know for me to share with this holy community the power of faith, the power of scripture, the power of our sacred tradition that calls on us. I know that it's been coming from you too, and it magnifies. In the last couple of weeks since the, the, the terrible tragic death of George Floyd, to pull from the text that says, the blood of your brothers screams from the ground. We hear the screaming. To read the text, all humans are created in the divine image and to reckon with the fact that that's not how people are treated in our country. To read the sacred text that says, justice, justice, pursue. And to think of how do we pursue it. To read the text, you shall not stand idly by. These are animating us and I know they're animating you. Pastor, a piece of our sacred story to the story of leaving Egypt. That was generations ago. The story sits in our soul and it animates us to see others who've gone through Egypt or are going through Egypt. And it says, we have to reach out and help. I know that for you as an African-American man, you're living this in a different way than I am. This is a piece of your story. It's a piece of your life and many people in your communities. And as we think about how we bring these values to life, my community and I need to listen. We need to listen. Story is that which lifts up what needs to happen and which leads to healing. We need to hear story. We need to say hineni. A key word in our tradition is shema. Shema Yisrael, listen. And I have to say, we often are not great listeners. We have our own opinions and our own thoughts and our own sense of we need to do X, Y, and Z. It all starts with listening. Pastor, we're here today to listen. We're here today to listen with heart and soul. We're here to say our listening, our shared presence at pain, our ability to lament together, to cry, to pray, and then to move forward and to act, that comes from listening. So I call on everyone at Beth Jacob, those who are here, Shema, listen. Hineni, we are here, we are present. God bless you, Pastor. It's a pleasure to welcome you to your home. There's water there. Let me begin, let me begin by 
uh, just saying, uh, giving honor to God, who your community knows as Yahweh Elohim El Shaddai, and who I, as a Christian, we know through the person of Jesus. It's so amazing to be here with you guys today. And Rabbi Ezra, as I say, I'm so deeply moved uh, by the words that you have just shared a few moments ago. And, and certainly I give honor. I'm so grateful for the, this remarkable opportunity to share with this amazing community. And it gives me an opportunity to say <clears throat> just a word of, of um, thank you uh, as you have continued to generously allow us to share this beautiful facility. And I can't tell you how comforting it has been for me as an African-American leader of a very diverse community going through this difficult time to know that one thing I don't have to worry about is where my our people will worship at across race and ethnicity, that, that, uh, that I can just not worry about that because you guys, your generosity has been so solid. So thank you, Rabbi. Uh, it's just awesome to be with you guys today. And I ask the God who binds us together to fill this moment with his spirit. Amen. The prophet Amos, in many ways, convenes us together today with those uh, powerful words. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And when you hear those words, they call us to ask the question, why so much pain? Why so much protest? Why in many instances so much violence that has broken out across our nation in every major city and literally across the world? Why? And let me just make it clear up front so I don't forget to come back to this point. I wholeheartedly condemn the violence in any form or fashion. But those words, let justice come down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, invites us to consider the question, why? And it causes us to look back first and foremost at the history of discrimination particularly as it relates to African-Americans here in America, the why behind what we're experiencing. Let me take a moment to point out that the African-American people, that we are the only people group who have ever been legally enslaved on American soil. Not just for 300 days, but for 300 years in one of the most brutal expressions of inhumanity to humanity ever, ever witnessed for 300 years. The entire culture reinforced that African-Americans were inferior, were to be feared, and that we were expendable. And then that 300 years was followed up by another 100 years of segregation, where the notion that African-Americans to be feared and that we are inferior and expendable continue to be encoded in law through what was called the Black Codes or what is also called Jim Crow laws. The Supreme Court ruling that says it was perfectly okay to keep people separate because after all, African Americans were so um, to be feared and expendable, you didn't want to contaminate the American culture by mixing us up. So we went to separate schools and we drank from separate water fountains and we rode in the back of the bus. And during that period of time, from the late 1800s to 1968, more than 4,000 African-Americans would be lynched publicly as public spectacles, as people would gather and uh, with the full support of government and officials. All of this speaks to the question of why. And all of that has encoded and soaked into every fabric of American life and into every institution this notion of racism that is lived out in practice, policy, and through people. Listen, 400 years of that means that at the end of the day, that there is not an institution in America that is not afflicted with this notion. And 50 years cannot rapidly erase. 400 years. So it is true that till this very day, 
African Americans still contend with the brutality of systemic racism. That's part of the answer to the question, why? And when I hear the prophet cry out, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, I hear in that age old powerful uh, calling of the prophet, I hear exasperation. Exasperation is expressed by two of my staff members uh, last week when I asked them to share, uh, how are you doing doing this? And, and both Jesse and Terry, who are part of my staff, started off, African-American men, started off sharing by saying, here we go again. Exasperation. You see, despite the fact that in today's world, on the other side of advancements, uh, the, the advantages uh, secured by the civil rights movement, Despite the fact that African Americans are doctors and lawyers and engineers, despite the fact that we have millionaires and billionaires uh, now a part of the African American communities, scientists and doctors, despite all of that, 40 million Americans, African Americans wake up, I think, every day still saying, maybe this is the day. Maybe this is the day that we no longer have to prove that we are as good as anyone else, that we no longer have to prove that you need not fear us, that we are not inferior, and we are certainly not expendable. Maybe this is, I mean, after all, this is the era of former President Barack and Obama and his amazing wife, Michelle. This is the era of Tiger Woods and, and uh, Serena Williams. This is the era of African Americans leading major corporations like American Express, et cetera. This is the time, right? We catch our breath, take a deep breath. And then we see again and again, like a kind of drip drop of the rain that never ends across our TV sets and our telephones and our computer screens. African American men and women continue to be violated at the hands of police brutality. It's simply one expression of this racism. We take a deep breath and we hope again there's no accountability. The folk who perpetrate are not a, even arrested. It all comes to a head a couple of weeks ago. We we're all sheltered in place, all of us, about a month and a half. And now we have time to kind of reflect and pay attention, not distracted by the hustle and bustle of life. And all of a sudden, we all together see on one screen, you know, Will Smith says that uh, police brutality is not getting worse, it's getting filmed. And we all together saw on one screen, if you will, the epitome of this notion that is held by some people that African American continues to be inferior, continue to be the people to be afraid of and expendable. One white police officer places his knee on the neck, neck of Mr. George Floyd for eight minutes, 84 seconds. He stands on his neck with his knee, his hands in his pocket, He's looking around cavalierly. All the while, Mr. Floyd is, is beginning to call for his mom, who's been dead for two years. All the while, people are standing along the street and saying he's bleeding, let him up. All the while, finally, Mr. Floyd begins to say, I can't breathe. And cavalierly, this white police officer, with the support of three other police officers, keeps his hands in his pocket, looks around, keeps his knee on that man's neck until he goes unconscious. And for another minute plus, he keeps that posture until that man dies. And that's, that's, that did it, guys. <laughs> kind of in one collective gulp, 40 million African Americans and a whole lot of other people of good conscience and goodwill collectively said together, I can't breathe. That injustice is strangling us, that, that racism has its knee on our neck. Get your knee off our neck. We can't breathe. That's the why beneath the pain and the protests and even the why beneath the violence. Yes, there are some extremist groups that's trying to uh, perpetuate violence, but 
beyond all of that, there, there, there is this collective cry of the people that say enough is enough. Let justice finally roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream and let it come now because I can't breathe. So that's the why. You get it? Does it make a little sense? Now let's talk about the question, what can we do together? Because that prophetic call that justice rolled down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream is also the demand for action. So what can we do? Now, here's where I find so much hope as an African-American leader talking to a Jewish community around the question, what can we do? <laughs> it has so much hope because you know, our coming through the Red Sea in many ways uh, is uh, the victories of the 1960s, right? It's the passage of the 1964 uh, uh, Civil Rights Act. It's the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It's the passage of, of fair housing in 1967 and 68. And, and walking alongside of us, helping us to win those ba battles was you, the Jewish community. You were walking along uh, in the person of, for example, <clears throat> Rabbi uh, Abraham Hessel, who, who marched side by side with Dr. King and declared those powerful words, we pray with our feet. You were there with us as we remember the stories of Goodman and Cheney and Swerney, uh, 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 African-American and white and a Jewish uh, three young men who died in the fight for justice that America would somehow stand up together and overturn racial injustice. You know, you guys have been there. So part of this moment is an opportunity for me to say thank you for how you've been there. And, and our unique struggles uh, continue to intersect even in this contemporary moment. You know how? Because we all remember the horrible violence of Tree of Life Synagogue where, where the worshipers were murdered for no other reason, in the midst of worship, for no other reason than the fact that they were Jewish. And that's tied to an event that happened in the same period of time where, where people were murdered at Mother Emmanuel AME Church for no other reason other than the fact that they were black. We know what it's like to be targeted by hatred. We have a unique intersection of our struggles. So this question of what can we do together is already, for me, infused with so much hope. Let me offer some practical uh, answers to the question, how do we continue to take some steps together? First of all, I want to challenge you, if you're not African American, in this era, to reach out and identify two or three other two or three African-Americans that you want to sit down with. And as the rabbi pointed out, listen, ask us to share the story of race for us here in America. And when you listen, listen with a heart that is prepared to lament as your first and best response. Now, here's what you got to be careful. Here's what you need to know. That when you ask an African American to share our story of race in America, you are asking us to expose to you our trauma. And so when you engage with us in dialogue around our trauma, that is a sacred moment. So be sure that you do not allow the conversation to drift into uh, an opportunity for you to make a political point about your social position or re-ratify some stereotype that you may have about race in America. This is a moment for you to listen and your response has to be a lament. It has to be a response that says, and when I share with you my experience of injustice, you have to be a, a, become angry alongside of me, uh, uh, with me, alongside of me about that that, that horrible experience that you must be willing to weep with me as I share with you about my pain. Amen. We must lament together in the sacred moment of gathering around trauma. Second thing that 
Uh, you can do it. The third thing, first is listen, second is listen. The third thing is really captured in the metaphor, walking together. Uh, it's really my metaphor for learning. Rabbi, I mentioned this a few moments ago. This is a moment for you to learn about what it means for me and other African Americans to exist and to live in this country. Now listen, I use the walking metaphor because this is important. You cannot walk one mile in my shoes, but you can walk a hundred miles beside me. So the dialogues that you begin to have with African Americans, let those dialogues be starting points as you begin to pursue real and deepening relationships with them. And just, I just believe that God begins to knit our hearts together as we, as we listen, as we lament together, as we begin to walk together and learn cross race. Now, let me just make you aware of one thing that you need to be aware of. As you think about learning from African Americans, be aware of the skepticism that is often in the room. Now, here's what I mean. I've had many opportunities to share my uh, story of race in America with people who are not African American. And after hearing my story, they, uh, they find the story to be painful and compelling, but they are skeptical that it is a legitimate example of racial bias. They're skeptical that it is a legitimate example of systemic racism. And the reason why they have the privilege of being skeptical happens to be their context. They've never lived a day as an African American in America. Now, let me just take a few moments and just illustrate this point for you. I showed up on the planet in terms of living life after the gains of the 60s. I can remember in elementary school, our elementary class was the first integrated class in our town. And a whole host of parents took their kids out of the public school with the support of the educational system and established a private school because they didn't want their kids to be contaminated by these black kids. I was in that class. I remember in college organizing and registering uh, several thousand folk to vote and forcing our small city, Grambling, because I was a student at Grambling State University, historic black college, to raise money to build a clinic in, in Grambling. Why? Because year after year, hundreds of African American students would go to the healthcare system next door in Ruston, Louisiana, and we would, we would be violated in a thousand different ways, humiliated and, and disrespected horrifically. A few years later, as a young seminarian, finishing up my seminary career here in the Bay Area, by the way, I just finished preaching at a church and my wife and a baby in the back seat. We drove up in the, in the parking lot of my father-in-law's house only to recognize that the police hemmed us in, swarmed out of their cars, surrounded my vehicle with their hands on their guns, only to discover at the end of the day, it was mistaken identity. You see, I've worked through education, I've worked through healthcare, I've worked through police, you see, institutional. I, I, this is my experience. I remember being a young pastor in Arkansas and organizing the parishioners of my church with the larger community to push back against the banks in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and Little Rock, Arkansas, because they had drawn an invisible red line around certain communities and certain zip codes, all, all of whom were African Americans, and they had decided they would not give mortgages to the people in that community, and if so, they would be at an outlandish interest rate. That's my experience in America. I remember becoming a new pastor in Boston, Massachusetts. I walked into a Woolworth store, dressed kind of like I am today, and I pulled out my wallet to pay for something I had purchased. And the woman saw I had several credit cards, and she took my credit card, said, please wait here, went back, showed it to the, the manager. The manager calls my credit card company. My credit card company calls my wife and says, I think your husband's credit card has been stolen. And I stood there being humiliated and all I wanted, being treated as a criminal, when in fact I was just a preacher trying to purchase something at the word. 
just a few weeks ago, I go into a corner store and the person behind the counter ignores the other three people in the store and keeps both eyes on me. Now, the chances are that's nothing like your experience. So when I tell you that I think this is a racial biased experience, trust me, I got a lot of experience. And name your context, which is the context that says this has not been your world, even if you have experienced discrimination in your life. It's not backed up by 400 years of policy and practice and people declaring that you are to be feared because you're inferior and expendable. Let me end here. I'm so grateful for our time. So first, we need to listen together. Second, we need to lament together. Thirdly, we need to be willing to learn from each other, naming the skepticism in the room and naming the context of that skepticism. And then lastly, we have to be willing to lift up justice together. We are people of faith, so that begins with prayer. Prayer reminds us that there are aspects of this struggle that is deep and and as the rabbi pointed out, spiritual. There, there is a spirit of loose in America. There's a spirit that is horrific and hate-filled that is loose in America. But there is a greater spirit that's loose in America. We see it as, as, as people, not just African-American, but across race and ethnicity and generations are now filling the streets all, all over America, risking their lives to say, you know what? Maybe African-Americans can't breathe in this moment, but we're coming alongside of you and we're going to help you catch your breath for justice. There's a spirit that's spilling out all over the world as people from uh, Syria to Canada to Italy to countries on the African continent are marching and declaring we're standing with African Americans against police brutality in this moment. There's a spirit, I call it the spirit of God, loose in the world. You can always identify with the marks of justice. So what does it mean for you? So first we pray. But secondly, in praying, we ask God to show us opportunities that we can stand together and fight for justice. In other words, how can I find in my sphere of influence, where in my sphere of influence can I leverage who I am to push forward the fight against systemic racism. I've been so inspired by police officers. You know, these police officers at the center of what we just talked about there, at the center of police brutality. But let me just call out very quickly, the tens of thousands of police officers who go to work every day, they are genuine officers of peace and justice. And I've been inspired by police officers who some are taking a knee for eight minutes and 84 seconds to, to stand in solidarity with, with, with those who have faced police brutality. Others are holding up signs saying, uh, we stand in solidarity against police brutality. Uh, others are, are joining the marches and they're marching along with the protesters and, and, and others are, are, are coming together and, and releasing statements. There's a, 101 different ways that police officers say enough is enough and they're using their power in their sphere of influence to make a difference. What about you? You see, we must seek to make a difference from the boardroom to the ballot box from the corner store to the classroom, from the public forum discussion to discussions with our grandkids and our grandparents about this thing called racial justice. I end here. The words of uh, Amos, I find them intersecting. The great hymn of the civil rights movement we shall overcome. And I just want to say today that I'm more convinced than ever, deep in my heart, I do believe, because God is loose and 
the people of God are standing, we shall overcome. Black and white together, Jew and Gentile together, we're closer than we've ever been before. So keep believing. Keep believing. I know it. We shall overcome. Thank you. So, you know, uh, when I'm always at NBCC, the crowd's all giving me amens and hallelujahs. And I don't know if you heard, it was hard to restrain as pastor was speaking because my heart was full with amens, and hallelujah, and quiet listening and love. Uh, a piece of other history for you to know is that the rabbi who preceded me, Rabbi David Teitelbaum, marched in Selma with Dr. King. And it is a piece of the defining ethos of this synagogue. And it was one of the things that drew me to become the rabbi here, is that sacred history. Mm -hmm. That was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. We have a long way to march still, Amen. a long way to walk, and we'll do it side by side. And we're at that point where the power hour is supposed to be starting, but I know that the people who are in that service are also with us. In a second, We'll have you go off and then go back on to the power hour site. But I feel like we need to end with song. We need to end with song. So Cantor Barbara, let's sing hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Let's sing hallelujah, Psalm 150. It's a song that people from NBCC uh, can, can join us in. It's transliterated, even though the words are small. And join in the chorus. And let's listen to Cantor Barbara. And we are sharing with Pastor all of the, the comments that are in the chat. Cantor, let's sing hallelujah. Everyone singing at the very end, we'll all unmute. Hallelujah. 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 Shalom, everyone.